Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me here on this uh, decent Sunday afternoon. My name is Daniel Colvin. I'm the owner of CS Gallery. We're here with uh, Joseph Thompson, um, also known as JT. Um, and we are showcasing uh, JT's work um, in all rooms of the gallery for this last show of the 2014 show season. So we're really excited to be doing that. JT, again, thanks for being here. I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I've heard other people to describe your work um, as Cubist, um, and personally I see a little bit of that influence, um, I, but you, you describe your work as uh, geometric surrealism. Um, and I know that, you know, as far as classical surrealists go, they really tried to shy away from um, anything that had strong definitive shapes or lines or whatnot. And, uh, and I know that uh, you've said before that you don't uh, define yourself as a cubist. Um, and also, you know, uh, a lot of the surrealists um, really tried to focus on um, the kind of free association that would happen and, and help to uh, create that spontaneous expression that was the basis for a lot of uh, the works. And I know myself personally, um, I see a parallel uh, between you and uh, Duchamp, the way that his work really rode that line between the free expressionist kind of uh, things that the surrealism did uh, and a little bit of a cubist taste. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, like if you can't see the monitor, you can come up and look at what Duchamp's work looks like. I mean, uh, the, the, the best one that I got was uh, that, that kind of, I felt touched a little bit on the style and flavor of JT's work was um, New Descending the Staircase. Um, and, you know, Marcel Duchamp was also the guy that did Armut the Toilet, and he did all kinds of different surrealist works and sculptures and installation. So the guy was all over the place. Um, but, you know, he also had, as a surrealist artist, he did do work that kind of, you know, related a little bit to what, you know, JT is doing. Um, so basically the, the question that I'm trying to ask is, where do you feel that your work really hits that surrealist note um, and, and, and creates that separation from, you know, cubism or any of the classic surrealists, um, you know, to, to, to define, like, the, the body of what you're trying to do, of what you call geometric surrealism. Um, and you are right. When you sit here and look at this piece, he has one of the few that's adding some, one of some highlights, A, if you want to call it, they're pushing a light source. So these planes, there's light source bouncing around, which therefore, yes, this is a nice example, because that is what I'm trying to do with some of these pieces. I've added a light source, and I noticed a lot of abstract individuals don't have a light source in the composition. And if you're talking about the surrealist point of geometric surrealism, when I'm going with the surrealism, I'm using a light source and helping create some atmosphere, dream state, so that's where I'm coming with the aspects of the surrealism part of it. Uh, cubism, I've been painting cubism for a few years, but it was very constricting to me as far as, you know, most cubism are still interacting with representation. They're going to use their subject matter, a table, a person, and therefore you're going to see that in there, no matter if it's an expression of or an essence of their subject matter, you're still seeing it. The majority of these paintings in here is, is dealing with a planar aspects of movement. And I'm using a light source as a direction to push a viewer through the composition. Um, so there the surrealism is coming from is that light source, that false space, that dreamlike space where I'm using somewhat of a one point, two point perspective. Uh, so that's where the surrealism part is coming from. And of course, you're talking geometric. That's very angular, very hard-edged in the majority of them. And I can also use a harder edge closer up and softer edge creates more space. So those is why I came up with the geometric surrealism. When I look up a lot of cubist pieces, it doesn't fit in that realm. And if you look up surrealism, it's not going to fit in that realm. But I pulled up some more geometric what is called geometric art, it really doesn't fit in that realm either, but the aspects of the angularity fits into the geometric. So a friend of mine, well, someone of a friend, he's, he's uh, just really known him 
last few months been coming around and I was at one time calling myself more of the cubist surrealism and he's like no you're really your work is more geometric surrealism so I started going with that point and picking out of things of surrealism that what means to me to surrealism using a lot of false space atmospheric concept dreamlike um, and try to incorporate it into my angular planes in space, if you want to call it. So that's why I put that title on my work. Right. Okay. Do you do you feel that there are any um, abstract expressionist uh, notes in any of this? Because I, I also get a feel for that too. Because I mean, like the I know uh, again going back to some of the classical surrealists. Like if you start looking at John Arp, if you look at Moreau, if you look at some of these guys that really created space with uh, the, the, the same sort of space that you're talking about, but with a very uh, organic uh, type um, shapes and, and, and compositions. Um, you, you're, you're right, it really doesn't fit into that category. But if you get into some of the other um, abstract expressionists, if you look at uh, if you look at Rothko, if you look at um, a little bit of de Kooning, maybe not so much you know Pollock, because Pollock did all, all the dance like movement drawings and whatnot. But I mean, you do have some of that depth and flow of layering as far as lines and stuff. I mean, if you wanted to make that kind of a stretch, it's like. But I mean, do you, do you feel like there's any of that kind of because I mean, like these these are very engaging, they're very emotional, they're very dramatic, and that's a lot of what the abstract expressionists try to capture. Well, once again, uh, you know, people can put a title on all they want on my work. You know, I don't go and research as I paint. Um, a lot of this, you know, I talk about the conscious subconscious. A lot of times I'm laying these out, and I don't even know I'm laying them out, because it's kind of such a habit form. When I'm creating an abstract, creating a big piece, what I'm really trying to do is an engage the viewer, moving around through composition. Could that be from uh, value, could be shape, could be line. So I'm at the point where when I'm laying these out, it's coming such a habit, it's a very zen, and sometimes I step back and don't even realize as I'm drawing this that this is the composition. You know, this big yellow piece, it started out with circles on it. And the more I looked at it, the more this, this composition was saying, no, these circles aren't working with all these layers you're trying to lay in here, all this angularity, the circles is not conforming and fitting into this space. So I had to break off from those circles. So a lot of times I let the painting talk to me as well. It may sound weird, you may think I'm weird, but I let the composition, I let the painting, and I have a conversation. Um, a lot of times you stay, people always stay so to their drawings. Um, to me, that's constricting. That's not what an artist is about. A lot of people, we always say, think outside the box. Uh, well, I say there is no box. So what I try to do is have a nice conversation with this canvas, and a lot of times it stays to where I want it to be, and a lot of times it's totally changed. Like I said, this piece had a lot of circle movement in it, and what I was trying to do is create an overlap of elements, but they all fit and the circles weren't going together. And this was a horizontal piece and I started rotating it and another composition fell through and then rotate it again and the final composition shows up. It felt very grounded, nice movement. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is I work, I don't go and research certain styles, certain isms. I may snag a few from what I may like about this painter and incorporate in my own. I don't want someone to label me saying, oh, you paint like this person, oh, you paint like that, oh, I see this influence. I try to grab tiny little bits of who I appreciate or what they're doing and incorporate it to make it my own. I mean, as, a, as an artist, I feel the same way. It's really, really tricky whenever you start to try to label yourself with past movements because one of the things that's really challenging about where art's gone um, in our modern era is is that you know everything's really been done you know I mean it's oh, just course. you know I mean it's just become this crazy big melting pot of influence to where there's really no such thing as true originality anymore I don't think I think it's just a matter of like how can I take what's been established before and and do it in my own unique voice to stand out a little bit more than the other guy that's also drawing the same influences. You, are you know, exactly correct. you know, I mean, uh, and it's and it, and it gets tricky that way. And and, and I don't think that you're um, uh, uh, weird at all because of, uh, about having the canvas speak to you and have it have it uh, do very 
uh, this very kind of organic involvement. Uh, I speak to a lot of writers. I speak to a lot of musicians. I speak to, I mean, I mean, how I even speak to chefs that uh, that will let these things evolve themselves as they go. Like, like uh, there's a number of authors that say that you know they really don't try to develop a character. They let the character speak to them as they write. And you know? that is how I feel about a lot of these paintings. Now, a few of these are very um, emotional creations. Uh, you know something that's happened to me in my life that I, I uh, so I'm not using it as a theme, but it helped create peace, like this piece right here. Right. Is, well, here, well, let's, let's, let's go ahead and use that as a segue. And, and I'm going to go ahead and actually read this because I don't want to misquote you. Okay. Um, it says, in your statement, um, you say that you are philosophically interested in the subjectivity of the mind and its capacity for skewing perspectives of external events or the physical world. So I interpret that as trying to translate the influence of events and the emotions they invoke in your life to canvas through the manipulation of line perspective and color transitions within your compositions. So, so, so basically, which pieces do you in here do you feel really encompass that, that, that goal that you feel like you really just nailed it? I mean, and if, if you feel you can, like, you know, why? What, 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 sure. what, was, what was the influence? What was, what was the backstory? There's really four pieces in here that I've come through a thought process of why I want to do this but not show in the physical realm of what we live in in, in our dimension. Um, this, big, this piece right here, this was about a relationship, a starting relationship. And usually a lot of times we meet somebody at first, first date, first gather, that everybody's at a standoffish period. You don't want to let somebody in right off the bat. You can even be really cold when you meet them. Don't want to share, afraid of getting hurt. So um, what I was doing this piece was trying to show layers. And that first layer of obviously blues and cools, which are supposed to recede in the background, I'm breaking that realm of making the cools in the foreground, which is basically there's that cold wall when you meet somebody and to protect your inner self, protect your souls, protect your feelings. And what I was trying to do is manipulate that and show that the, my first appearance of meeting this person was very cold, very reserved, and I'm going through trying to peel and to really get to know this person as the layers get farther down in the back. And of course you got this big red wall, which is of course the strongest piece in the spectrum, so it's much harder to get through. And uh, you also see keyholes, so that's an accent that I'm trying to find the key to unlock this person's soul and tear down the barriers and get to them. So this is where this abstract piece was coming from. So that was my taking my relationship of our reality of what I'm trying to do in life and meet this person and transform it into a nice abstract composition. Um, a small little blue piece in the corner that, you know, I just, you know, a lot of times it's abstract 50, abstract 60, because they are abstracts, but a few of them are a theme or a feeling, and that piece is basically dealing with the death of Christ. And I was trying to emulate something so traumatic in our, in our realm, our dimension, when he died, this person died, this entity died. It was kinetic energy, and it's kind of like a bullet going through our atmosphere. It's just this massive kinetic energy, this big void of that has crushed our fabric. So that's what I was trying to emulate in there is that fact, is that even though in death there is life, that's what the red speck is supposed to mean, and you're getting closer into it. I have the symbol, the most oldest symbols, a male and female, pointing right into the little red speck, which is... To be considered life, you know, blood is life. Mm -hmm. And so that's where that piece is coming from. So it wasn't just a compositional piece breaking out. You've got these thin little fabric layers breaking through, creating a cross as well. But far as the composition-wise and abstract-wise, it's still breaking down your fundamentals. I'm trying to create a nice abstract piece. People can have a conversation, creating space, creating depth with the values lines and breaking the place. I've seen other artists um, that will do sort of the same thing to where they will have like composition number this or abstract number this, but then they will have 
um, a subtitle in parentheses. Have you ever thought about having parenthetical uh, uh, I, I should, subtitles put on there to give people a little more access to what you're trying I to do? I really hear? think I should, but also when I don't want to, because once you put a word out there, it's ingrained in a person's brain, and I'd rather have a viewer just go with their own thoughts of what they're looking at. So that's kind of why I keep falling back and forth of should I put the subtitle, why I did this, or just let the individual viewer make their own reality what they're looking at. I think that both sides of that argument is 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 kind of valid, but I, I myself personally, I always feel that I mean, if, if if you're trying to create something that has like this level of a of emotional depth and subcontent, like giving them like a small snippet, like a key of entry or an entry point to be able to access the deeper meaning of what you're trying to get at. It's kind of like having a book that's either titled or untitled. You know, I mean, like the, the, sometimes the title of the book really sets you up for what it is, the content of the pages. I was talking to a couple of people viewing this piece, and they're really into it. They're they like what was going on, happening, the whole space, the whole movement. And then I told them what I did, and they said, wow, that was totally, we weren't even close to why you did this painting. So once again, I, I kind of, even though I created this piece, there was a reason I created this piece. It's still more about I want the viewer to have their own thoughts of what they're looking well, at. Well, do you feel that at that point in time, like once you enlightened them to where you were coming from as an artist, it made that piece less desirable? I mean, I, I mean, because I think that... Because it just threw them for a realm. They're like, wow, I, I, I never would have right. come up with that idea. Well, because hypothetically, let's say that, that, that a piece gets invested and, you know, we, we all become rich and famous off your paintings and you're supposed to go back and, you're, and, and, and people are going to research and talk about where these things come from. I mean, like where you came from, you know, as an artist to create these pieces should and would eventually get out there somehow. Well, yeah, eventually yeah. they're going to because I don't have a problem if someone starts talking about a piece that I will bring that up. Say, well, the real reason of why I broke this composition out was was this. You know, there's another small little yellow ochre piece in the, the back room. There's only been a very, maybe three or four people that have noticed that there is a figure in this composition. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, you're correct. There is, there is a figure in it. And it's about um, another past relationship, protecting your heart. So you see this composition and you see a head looking back while it's holding a red sacred and some uh, breaking forms of hands or fingers or arms holding this together. Majority of people have not seen that composition that way. They're just looking at this nice abstract movement. But once again, there was that one piece of why I did this. This is why I really created this abstract. This was my emotional connection to this piece. Now, is that therapeutic for me? Yes. Um, but it's not really why I want to show the piece. I'm really creating this nice depth abstract piece. Now, I'm just taking my experience, my emotional aspect, and creating this piece. So that's maybe kind of why I'm, I might not like to put that subject on there because then everybody would be wanting, okay, why'd you do this abstract? Why'd you right, do this right, abstract? Right. Well, I did this abstract because it's composition and I'm creating my whole theme of space movement and I'm really provoke, wanting to provoke you, the viewer, to make your own reality of what you're looking at. You may see something that I don't see and I get that a lot from someone looking at my abstracts and I'm like, it's really what you want to see. Um, the piece isn't here, but it's a it's a collector owns it's a big blue piece it's called Simplicity in Blue. Um, through the whole composition, I've hidden faces, multiple layers of faces. That piece falls a little more on the cubistic stop side. It's an older piece, but it's been in a few shows, and um, a lot of people say, "Now I'm seeing different profiles of faces, seeing many layers of faces," and uh, I'm like. You're seeing what you want to see. That's not where I was going. And so that's a lot of times I don't want to put a title name on a piece. I want the viewer to use their own imagination and come up with what they want to do. I get that. And, and, and that's sometimes the really tricky thing about accessing this style, this flavor of work. Because, you know, at the same time, you don't want to be... You know, leading the bull around by its nose, but 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 you but you also don't want to be stuck 
in that situation, like that old parable of like, you know, the, the, the old man, the donkey, and the little kid. It's like everybody has their own opinion of who should be riding who, yeah. you know, and how much information you should have. And at the end, you just end up killing the donkey, you know? And so it's, so it's just, you, you, you gotta, you, you, you gotta, it's tricky to, to figure out how much information you want people to have so that they are like, you know, touching on who you are as an artist. I mean, and, and, then, and then other artists feel that that's just completely irrelevant. You know, it's just like the work is what it is. It's on the wall. You know, this is this is this is my creation, but it is a separate entity from myself as a creation. And so that's, I guess, what I'm trying to get to the point where if someone wants to have a conversation and say, "Give me the true in depth of what this is happening," right, right. I will give it. Like I said, there's only. But you're not necessarily trying to volunteer. No, that I'm not going to volunteer that information because okay. um, then they'll be wanting, well, what went behind this one? What went behind this one? Well, a lot of them is more just about creating a nice abstract piece, and you use your imagination to see what you want to see. A gentleman was talking about the big vertical where he's like I feel like I can stand on this plane and want to look down how far down this red is behind all this yellow he, he goes I feel like I want to jump on all these planes and, and float through and stand on them I mean that's what I was trying to perceive with this piece that is the main piece where I finally said okay when uh, my friend said you're more of a geometric surrealism is when I really tried to push the one point two point atmosphere fake space, faux space of where you want to stand in here and, and feel this dream state rooms. That's really what I was trying to push with this piece was coming from when uh, my friend told me it, it was, you need to get away from the cubist because it's not fitting in this realm and that's why this piece fares so angular, so one point perspective in it with some highlights. Well, I'm going to read another quote because again, I don't want to misquote you. Um, it says, uh, you also say, and you've actually touched on this a little bit with the uh, blue piece um, with, uh, that you said was uh, more religiously inspirational. Uh, so you also say that you are interested in exploring the dualities of the conscious and subconscious, good and evil, light and dark. Beyond the obvious play on value dynamics of light and dark, how are you exploring those things within your work and which pieces do you feel can fade this most successfully. Uh, you want to talk about light and dark, there's another piece that's, you know, once again, I just titled it abstract, I think uh, 49, but the odd name I was giving it for myself was the tree of knowledge. And there's your light and dark kind of aspect as far as religious theme, if you want to go there. But you're also talking about the duality of your, your conscious subconscious. Uh, your unconscious. And when I thought I talk talking a little bit, when I'm doing a lot of these, I don't have a set drawing. I don't have a set idea. Um, it's become habit form for me to start breaking out a composition, and it's become such a habit form that I don't even realize I'm even doing it. You know, there's where I'm trying to talk about your conscious to your unconscious or your subconscious. Uh, I think it was Freud saying um, our mind is like an iceberg and the tip of the iceberg is your conscious and everything underneath is the subconscious, which is becoming such a habit because you're unconscious, you know, breathing. That is part of me, but I don't realize I'm breathing. When I'm sleeping, I'm staying alive because I'm breathing. That is who I am, but am I conscious of doing it all the time? No. Um, my heart beats, blood flows. So there's where I was talking about your conscious and subconscious or your unconscious. When I'm creating this work anymore, when I first started doing abstracts, I would always have this black and white set in the box composition and would follow that from beginning to end. Um, I feel that's very constricting. I feel that's not what it's, to me, is what it's about. It's about an inner relationship with me in this composition and creating a nice movement, a nice space, or even if it's not nice, a very uh, conflicting. So I, like I said, there's where I'm having, my conscious is looking at a drawing after I step back and step back and see it. There's my conscious part. Okay, this is where I'm going. Now, what's my next part? And then sometimes I can paint for 30 minutes laying down value in line and not even realize what I did. It's such a habit, and there's my subconscious or the unconscious part of me 
trying to lay out what I'm seeing in my mind's eye. Uh, my mind's eye, sometimes I'll have to work on a piece for three or four months or set it aside and move on to another piece before I can finish that next piece. So there's where that statement's coming from of the conscious and, and subconscious. Dark and evil, we're always dealing with things in our life about good and evil. So there is some influential pieces. The tree of knowledge is kind of like that, you know, eat the fruit, don't eat the fruit kind of aspect. And, you know, you haven't really touched on the, the little red focal point. You know, that's kind of drawing you in. you got these hard lines trying to pull you out. Uh, good and evil is the death of Christ. Um, so those are some of the topics that kind of help make these abstract pieces. All right. Well, the um, the last thing I have uh, for you before we open it up to uh, anybody that might have any other questions or whatnot um, is uh, I, you know, as 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 the curator and as somebody that's been showing your work for a while, I get a lot of uh, questions and comments on how you choose to. Um, sign the work, the symbol that you use. It's like I, you know, know it as, you know, just an abstraction of your moniker, JT. Right. You know, but there have been a lot of people that have uh, commented on it being a pie symbol. There have been a lot of people that have um, related it to different uh, religious symbols. Um, and, and, and because it is kind of, you know, um, um, recognizable but ambiguous in its use at the same time, you know, I was I was just wondering if like how does the the choice to sign all your works with that symbol tie into your overall depth and meaning of of the um, work? I mean, or or am I just reading entirely too much into that? In, in no, general, no, really, you know? really are not. Um, when I first started this journey as wanting to be a painter, I noticed a lot of young artists, even old artists, established artists, it's all about their signature. Everything is about how they sign their piece. It's becoming, this is this is what it's all about. Well, to me, no, it's not about my signature at the bottom of this painting or where it's at. Uh, my name is a very long name, so it would become very dominant in a piece and could, to me is distracting from the painting. Um, so I started just doing JT, you know, one time it used to be Joseph T, Joseph Thompson, and this became uh, too much of a distraction to me. And I think uh, it's more about the painting than my name on it. I mean, you, you know I painted it, so therefore why does I have to have this big massive name? To me it's very narcissistic to have your big massive name on a, on a painting. People know you who painted it. Um, so I went with the JT. But I also stumbled across that uh, the way I do this, it's a symbolic for prosperity. I've heard others mean prosperity for good, good wealth, good health. So I kind of just ran with that as well. Um, people get more intrigued on how I sign it. So it, yeah, it's kind of a, a, a play, but also it's, it's a symbol. It's not large. It's not taken away from composition. And so that's kind of why I kept it the way it is. As a printmaker, I see a really close correlation to the uh, chops that uh, uh, that the uh, Japanese printmakers would would use. You know, sure. it was like you know, like 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 mono monosyllable or 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 uh, or dual symbol at the most. You know, just just like a stamp. You know, it's like it's and done. Yeah, there yeah. it is. You know, that's yeah. that's kind of how I feel about it as well. And, um, and if you notice, that they're all very. Cause I also notice a lot of. People who do sign their piece, they sign it the exact same way. Everything looks the exact same way. Same kind of movement. Um, I was about to go that route, but I, f I really truly felt that that's irrelevant. Um, it's JT. It's, it's who I am. And sometimes it's long and narrow. Sometimes it's a little short and fat. Sometimes some of the lines are a little thicker. Sometimes it's just very brushworky. Sometimes it's very fluid. It's just what brush I have in my hand. And if the paint's really thin, it's very fluid. And if the paint's kind of thick, opaque, it's very brush looking. So. Once again, it all just changes. It's JT, it's who I am. It's a stamp from when I have a discussion about like this one, it's long. This one, it isn't. They all vary. And I've noticed someone, I've seen a few people where they sign everything and it looks exactly the same on every painting. It doesn't need to be. Right on. Well, JT, thank Thanks you. Really. Appreciate it. Appreciate your work. Appreciate you taking the time.